Once again, I've got this unenviable position of speaking right after lunch when everybody's sort of lulled asleep, uh, full of stomach, and, and uh, yeah, we should go ahead. I, I, we have a speaker coming in right after me, so I don't want to take their time. I was going to speak today on, uh, this afternoon, on consumer product regulation. Um, there's a little bit of overlap here with... Um, some things that Bob Higgs talked about earlier today, uh, but uh, what I'd like to do is, is, is show you how Austrians tend to think about product regulation. Um, I guess I could give you the nutshell version, which would be there shouldn't be any. That's it, you can go home now. Uh, but there's, there's really a lot that we can say uh, beyond that fundamental uh, libertarian position on regulation um, about the consequences of efforts by the state to make consumers safer. Um, let me begin by mentioning Murray Rothbard's categorization of intervention by the government in uh, power and market. I think it may be mentioned elsewhere as well. It says there's three types of intervention by the state, autistic, binary, and triangular. Um, autistic inter intervention, you've probably heard that word autistic in another context, but autistic interve intervention would be intervention by an aggressor for which the aggressor gets nothing in exchange. So a homicide would be an example of an autistic intervention. Uh, governments, of course, do this. Uh, binary intervention would be where the state is getting something in exchange. Taxes or robbery or conscription would all be examples of a binary intervention. And then what we're most concerned with this afternoon is triangular intervention, where the government's interfering with two other parties who would like to make some sort of exchange, and then the government steps in and says, well, you can't just make the exchange the way you agree. You have to uh, adopt certain terms set by us. It could be wages, uh, minimum wage law would be an example of this kind of thing, labor conditions, OSHA regulations, occupational safety and health administration regulations would fall into this category as well. Uh, product quality regulations, which we'll talk about some today. Uh, all fall into this category of triangular intervention. Uh, Rothbard and Power and Market, by the way, there's a r fairly new version of uh, Man, Economy, and State, which has Power and Market appended to it at the end as it was originally written, and uh, that's available through the Mises Institute. Um, last year I got a copy for myself to replace my old yellow paperback that some of you might remember. Um, uh, and uh, power and market really is a great treatment of, of how government uh, intervenes in an economy to the detriment of people, um, buyers and sellers. But uh, Rothbard in Power and Market says that one of the favorite arguments for quality standards is that governments must protect consumers by ensuring that workers and businesses sell goods and services of the highest quality. The answer, of course, is that quality is a highly elastic and relative term and is decided by the consumers and their free actions in the marketplace. So quality is it's not as though we have products that are bad quality and products that are good quality. It's a sliding scale. There are trade-offs between quality and price and other, other um, characteristics of a good which are, which are taken into consideration by a consumer. So when I'm buying a car, I think about not only the, the price, and, and, but I also think about how long it will last and the expected repair bills and the fuel economy and the safety standards and the uh, capacity, other, other aspects of that car. There's a, a million of these characteristics that I take into consideration as a consumer. And what the regulators do is typically pick out one of these characteristics and say, well, consumers could have a safer car, or they could have a more fuel-efficient car, 
or they could have a cheaper car, or they could have whatever the characteristic of the moment might be. Failing to recognize, or at least ignoring the fact, that uh, there are trade-offs between these things. And I mentioned in one of my talks earlier this week that the corporate average fuel economy regulation, which requires auto manufacturers to meet an average, certain minimum average miles per gallon for their cars, and there's a separate standard for trucks, and, and this causes auto manufacturers to compromise safety and other characteristics. So we now have cars that are lighter than they would be otherwise because the corporate average fuel economy standard uh, induces firms to make cars that get better gas mileage. So as, a, as I said earlier this week, uh, we might have cars with better gas mileage, but they're consuming more human beings per mile than they would otherwise. On the subject of auto safety, we have this character here, uh, Ralph Nader. This is a much younger Ralph Nader than you would see today. But he made his name largely through his um, attack on the American automobile industry through a 1965 book called Unsafe at Any Speed. Well, um, the book focused on the safety problems of a rear-engined compact car at the time called the Corvair. Um, he, said that it tend, he said that it tended to roll too easily, it was unsafe, it shouldn't be allowed on the road, or at least the government should, should uh, make safety regulations on vehicles. Um, now, in, with regard to the Corvair, particularly uh, independent tests years later showed that the Corvair didn't behave any worse on the road than any other similar sized car. It wasn't all that unsafe in comparison with other cars that were being marketed, but by that time, the auto industry had the reputation of sacrificing safety in order to make more money. Um, many of the accusations that were leveled against the manufacturers of the time were not well-grounded scientifically, but the book did have a lasting impact because it, in part, was uh, the justification for the National Traffic Motor Vehicle Safety Act and subsequent changes to regulation of car safety. And this set up a new agency. It's, it it uh, required uh, manufacturers to include things in their cars that they had previously offered only as options. Um, I, I think that um, uh, one of the one of the most common cases that you would read about in a uh, maybe a business ethics class would be the case of the Ford Pinto. Um, most of you are too young to remember a lot of Pintos being on the road, but the uh, Ford Motor Company produced a lot of these things. Uh, compact, very cheap, good gas mileage for the time. And uh, the, your, your typical business ethics class is going to look at this as an example of how terrible the automobile industry was by producing cars that weren't as safe as uh, they could have been. Of course, again, we understand you can raise safety. You really can. You could have made a safer car than the Pinto. But of course, you're going to have to sacrifice something else. In the case of the Pinto, um, the... Um, uh, there, there was a well-known case involving uh, a, a rear-end collision. Um, someone uh, rear-ended a Ford Pinto on a Midwestern highway at night where the Pinto had been um, stopped in the road, apparently, and, and uh, three uh, young girls were killed as a result of that accident. And the Attorney General of the state decided to file lawsuit against Ford Motor Company for failing to include some fuel system improvement that might have um, prevented that, the fire and the, in, in the uh, crash. Um, it, it was pointed out that the, the uh, improvement would have cost some small amount of money per car, something like $7 or $10 or something. I don't recall exactly what it was, but it was a small amount of money. And uh, uh, most of your, your 
um, ethics classes would look at this and say, well, weren't three girls' lives worth spending an extra $12 per car? Ford Motor Company had decided otherwise. So this, is, this is taken as evidence of the, the, uh, the, uh, ab the, 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 the unreliability of the market system in providing for consumer safety. Well, Ford had, uh, had to make a choice, a, a financial choice. Safety is a scarce commodity. So are the other things that people would like to have in their cars. And, of course, you could have made a marginal improvement to the fuel system, and it might have cost $12 per car, but Ford was thinking, well, if we do this, we're going to produce however many hundreds of thousands or millions of these cars, and X number of dollars per car is going to translate into so many millions of dollars. And they expected, due to their calculations, that this would, uh, this would mean um, uh, saving X number of lives and, and preventing so many injuries as a result of this improvement. Well, then they looked at what seemed at the time to be a reasonable estimation of the value of a human life, and they looked at the court cases where there was a wrongful death lawsuit or a wrongful injury lawsuit, and they looked at what the courts were awarding in uh, payments to uh, families for wrongful death. And they said, well, well, we expect that if we don't do this improvement, then we will end up having to pay out X number of dollars in, in, uh, uh, in lawsuits. And if we do make the improvement, we're going to have to pay X number of dollars in making this fuel system improvement. Well, the fuel system improvement turned out was a larger number than the uh, the lawsuit total that they expected, and so they decided not to make the improvement. And a lot of people in, in, in um, ethics classes will, will say that this is horrible, how can you put a value on a human life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let's think about this a little more carefully. First, a human life does not have infinite value. Um, many of you traveled in a car or airplane to be here. You incurred some risk of the loss of your life in doing so. It might have been a small risk, maybe a one in a million chance that you would have lost your life in coming to this conference and sitting in these chairs, but it was a risk. Now, if your life had infinite value and you took a one in a million chance of losing your life, what financial expected cost would there be attached to your attendance at the conference? What's one over a million times infinity? Infinity. Now, I'm, I'd like to be flattered by your attendance here, but I really don't think that the value of attending this conference was infinite. So your own behavior in showing up at this conference indicates that you didn't value your life at infinity. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have taken the risk, however valuable the conference may have been. So your own behavior in taking these chances with your life to gain something of finite value indicates that your life, according to your own estimation, has finite value. Why then do we blame Ford Motor Company for making the same kind of assumption that the consumers do every day? Now, you don't have to buy a Ford Pinto if you, if you value safety, um, if you value your life more highly, then you have the option to buy a more expensive and safer car. But what the automobile manufacturers had done is they had offered a variety of cars with varying safety features and varying fuel economy and varying capacity and varying cost price. And they offered the Ford Pinto, and lots of people apparently said, well, I would rather have a cheaper, less safe car than have a more expensive, more safe car. Another way I think I would, I would ask you to look at this is, is to think about the many, many improvements that you could make to a car to improve the safety. Certainly the fuel system integrity was not the only margin on which the Ford Pinto could have been improved. 
maybe strengthen the steel in the frame, increase the thickness of the steel by a couple of millimeters at a cost of maybe $25. Maybe they could have uh, uh, put in a slightly stronger, powerful brakes at a cost of another $18. Maybe they could have um, put in a crumple zone or something in the front for another $17. Added a little padding in the dashboard for another $5. Um, made the uh, uh, another backup system for the uh, for the brakes or something else that, that would improve your safety. Beef up the suspension a little bit a little bit to make the handling better. Another fourteen dollars. But where do you stop with these marginal improvements? I mean, every you, you can take any product and marginally improve it for a slight increase in the price. You keep doing this, and you say, well. They should never stop. They should never, they should never hesitate to spend another $14 to achieve some improvement in safety. Okay, well, you keep doing this and you're going to wind up with an armored personnel carrier instead of a Pinto. You can drive down the road and be impervious, right? But people don't do this. They don't want to drive around in armored personnel carriers because they like to have something that gets better than two miles per gallon. So people will make these trade-offs voluntarily between safety and price and other features to the product. Typically, firms have an interest in getting that balance right. Bad business to kill your customers. Bad business to gain a reputation of producing a product that is less safe than people expected it to be. Now, in retrospect, you can look at the Ford Pinto case and you can say, well, if Ford had known that they would have been sued and they would receive this bad reputation as a result of the Pinto, they probably would have done something different. But they did the best they could with the information they had at the time. Now, I spent some time talking about the FDA in my talk this morning on health care, and uh, I believe uh, also we have a local uh, resident authority here on the, on the FDA and Bob Higgs, and um, he's done some excellent work in this area. I can't uh, come close to what he can tell you about the FDA, but I'll just briefly mention this um, agency, which is supposed to in increase your safety with regard to consuming food, foods and, and drugs. Bill Anderson, um, up at Frostburg State University has an, has an article that you can find online at the Mises.org uh, website in the, uh, in the February 1998 free market on, um, on uh, Teddy Roosevelt's um, creation of the FDA. And, and uh, Bill points out that after winning the election in 1904, Roosevelt launched into this progressive regulatory agenda, trying to um, target various industries that in the public's eye had a reputation of um, doing something uh, terrible to consumers. One of his first targets was the meatpacking industry. At the turn of the century, refrigeration was rare, and uh, the, even though the industry had developed some ice-chilled containers for transporting meats and ships to allow companies to transport uh, dressed meats over long distances. Uh, you had to keep this stuff on ice or it would spoil, as we know, and uh, preserva preservation techniques were not um, as advanced as they are today. Well, during the Spanish-American War, where Roosevelt got his reputation, um, uh, meat packers would ship these dressed meats to uh, Cuba for distribution to the troops, and they'd tell the quartermasters in the army, well, look, you need to keep this on ice. You can't just d dump it on a wagon and, and, and haul it inland or it'll spoil on the way. And, of course, the quartermasters did not listen. By the time the meat reached the troops, it was spoiled. The meat companies were then accused of profiteering by selling rotten meat to the troops. And uh, then, of course, Roosevelt... Um, gets this boost to this agenda in 1906 when Upton Sinclair publishes The Jungle, um, which you might have read in one of your classes. Uh, it's a favorite, I think, even today. One of these muckraking kind of novels where meat companies were accused of 
of uh, uh, doing all kinds of terrible things to their employees and customers and this novel along with uh, Roosevelt's inclination to regulate brought about the Food and Drug Act in 1906, which created the FDA. Uh, if, if you refer back to some of the things I said this morning and, and um, again, some of Bob Higgs' work on this, you find that the FDA actually creates barriers to entry. It is detrimental to consumers. It creates uh, delays and expense in the process of um, uh, uh, getting a new drug approved or even getting an existing drug approved for a new purpose. And by doing so, it will um, prevent innovation from occurring in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, if you're an existing pharmaceutical firm and you don't want new, upstart, innovative competitors, then the FDA is a great thing. But it's not such a great thing if you have a disease that could be addressed successfully by some drug that's in the pipeline that might eight or ten years later make it through the approval process. So the FDA delays introduction of new beneficial drugs and captures or it has been captured by the regulated industry um, to, to serve as a competition suppressant. Uh, again, you can look at Bob Higgs' book, Hazardous to Our Health. Um, you can look at some articles like this one by Patrick Weinert in All the Dangers of Food Safety. I ran across, though, an, ish, a, um, uh, uh, an article in the fall 2010 issue of the Independent Review um, by Yasuda, and uh, I, this is one of the best treatments of uh, food safety regulation I've seen. And of course, every so often you'll have a, an episode of some outbreak of E. coli or something, and, and uh, you will have uh, various scholars uh, say, well, see, this just proves that the FDA didn't have enough budget uh, money to fight this stuff, and so we still have these outbreaks, and that, that, that's an indication that the regulation is not strong enough, or we're not doing inspections with enough vigor, and so we need to have stronger FDA. Well, Yasuda does some really good things to try to poke holes in this, and I would recommend that to you if you have a chance. In fact, I believe that issue of the Independent Review is available out here in uh, the bookstore someplace um, in the Institute for you to pick up. Um, Unpasteurized milk. This has gotten some attention lately because there are some people, not very many, but a few people who would say, well, I don't want to drink pasteurized milk. I want my milk unpasteurized or raw. I don't want it to be uh, subjected to this treatment. Now, I'm, I'm not real familiar with all the reasons for rejecting pasteurized milk, but uh, there's a handful of people who think that this is a wise thing to do, that it's better for you or something, and so um, as it turns out, the FDA's long-standing ban on non-pasteurized, sorry, not the FDA, but the various states' long-standing ban against um, non-pasteurized milk does not seem to have had a beneficial effect. Now, the, the data on this are somewhat sketchy because we, we don't have the ability to measure illegal consumption of raw milk very well. Like a lot of illegal activities, it's difficult to figure out how much people are engaged in. But if you look at uh, the unpasteurized milk related cases of food poisoning, there were 245 cases in the non-prohibition states with about 64 percent of the population. So approximately two-thirds of the population, 245 cases in, case, in, in states where uh, you can legally consume the raw milk. And States with about a third of the population, 36% of the population, uh, there are 248 cases. So it does not appear that banning unpasteurized milk, at least based on this limited information, does not appear that this has any decisive impact on food poisoning cases related to raw milk. Now you could say, well, isn't pasteurization going to remove certain bacteria from the milk and so forth and make people better off? And, uh, that's, the FDA has, and, and, and the various state regulatory authorities have not established this beyond doubt. 
Uh, Yasuda also points out that there's no correlation between the budget for food safety going to the FDA and disease statistics. You get a, give the FDA a bigger budget and your disease statistics do not improve. There, over a number of years, was a dramatic decline in the FDA's border inspection rate for imported foods, but the foodborne disease statistics did not drop or rise, rather, did not rise along with that uh, decline in the border inspection rates. So it, it doesn't seem that the FDA is, is doing anything beneficial um, if, if, it, if it cannot affect disease statistics by their border inspections. Also, studies fail to show that restaurants with low inspection scores cause more food poisoning complaints. What good is the food? A lot of these inspections may inspect things that don't have a real close connection to food safety. Now, I, I really would like to beat up on the FDA some more, but I, I, maybe I've done enough of that today. Well, probably not, but... Um, in any case, when we're looking at regulatory efforts to reduce risk, we have to keep in mind that we cannot do just one thing. Everything you do is going to have an impact. And sometimes, it's, as you're backing away from one perceived problem as a, regula as a regulator, you're going to back into some other problem that might be more severe. One example of this would be the methylmercury regulations. Um, these are regulations primarily to, to uh, reduce the exposure to mercury, methylmercury in uh, seafood. Uh, the argument is that if pregnant women consume uh, mercury-laden seafood, and this can cause damage to their, to their children. Um, and yet, when the regulation says we're going to try to reduce uh, mercury, or at least warn people about mercury in seafood, people, not just pregnant women, but all kinds of people, reduce their consumption of seafood. Well, turns out seafood's actually good for you in some quantities, and this means that in addition to backing away from the risk of the mercury in the seafood, you're backing into the risk that you're not getting enough of the nutrients that seafood provides, which may increase heart attack risk and other things. So yes, maybe we're, we're reducing injury and death in one sense, but we might be increasing injury and death by backing into this other problem. Regulators are typically not good at making these kinds of balances. We talked uh, this morning in my other talk about type one, type two errors, and uh, how regulators just cannot seem to um, to, to make these, even if they were properly motivated to do so, which I don't think they are, even if they were properly motivated, they don't make these balances, these trade-offs very well. Um, if you lower someone's income, you're going to cause lost life. One approach... Um, according to uh, Kip Biscusi, is, is to look at the expense of government regulation, and uh, there are widely varying estimates of, of what the price of the government regulation is, but anytime you decrease income by 10 to 15 million dollars, you're going to lose a life, according to one uh, study by uh, Randall Lutter and John Morrill. Another approach says, well, it takes $50 million of lost income before you lose a life, somewhere in the economy. Um, there is a very high cost in some cases with some regulations in terms of the, the expense of the regulation and the lives that are lost as a consequence. According to one study, the high cost per life saved of the OSHA asbestos regulation leads to the loss of one and a half lives for every life saved by the reduction in the exposure to asbestos. 
Okay, I don't know if you, you know, you caught the math on that, but save a life, you lost one and a half lives. That's not a net improvement. Um, formaldehyde standards by OSHA are even worse. Uh, according to this study, they cost 25 lives for every expected death averted by the regulation. Now, of course, lives lost is not the only thing that you can measure. There are other things in life that are valuable um, besides extending your life. We all make trade-offs between life expectancy and other things, as we saw earlier. But according to uh, uh, Viscusi, about 4% of every dollar of production in industry is associated with health and safety costs. So when you impose a regulation on a consumer product, and this causes the manufacturer to engage in some additional effort, productive effort, that's going to, by itself, increase hazard somewhere in the economy. Uh, if you, you have a regulation, for example, on Superfund sites, toxic waste sites, and you, you have uh, people driving around in heavy machinery, hauling dirt around to try to reduce the risk, sometimes a minuscule risk, associated with a toxic waste site. Well, you know, people operating heavy machinery sometimes get hurt and killed. So you, you might be reducing some risk by reducing the toxic waste, but by encouraging this productive activity with the regulation, or requiring the productive activity with the regulation, you're also incurring other costs in human life and, and uh, human health. Um, this is called risk-risk analysis. You're trading one risk against another. Now, there is a, an argument for regulation that is based on the idea that the consumer of the product does not have the same information about the safety of the product as the manufacturer. Asymmetric information. I, I'm, as the manufacturer, I might know something about the safety of the product that you don't know if you're looking to buy it, because I'm a professional at producing this product, and you're not. All right, well, um, Again, I'll refer you to the Yasuda article, which treats this in, in, in passing. Um, Yasuda points out that if you look at um, fish and shellfish caught by the consumer, like a recreational fisherman, if you, ca if you look at the, the food poisoning rates associated with people catching and eating their own fish and self shellfish, those food poisoning rates are greater than the food poisoning rates associated with commercial fishing. You would think, well, if I'm at a restaurant someplace and I'm eating shellfish, I don't necessarily know where the fish came from or how much mercury is in it or what other toxins might be in the fish, and I, I have no idea who the, uh, who the fisherman was or where, what waters or what the water conditions were like where they went fishing or how long this stayed out in the open before it was refrigerated or anything. I don't, I don't have no idea. There's asymmetric information. But does it actually lead to human harm? It looks like the market pressures on commercial fishermen are sufficient that they don't sell spoiled fish to their customers. In handling the catch, commercial fishers pay greater attention to sanitation than recreational fishers do. So if anything, commercial fishers are producing super optimal levels of safety compared to people who catch and eat their own fish. It's difficult to argue that asymmetric information is leading people to, to get less safety than they would procure for themselves. And this idea of super-optimal safety might bear a little explanation. Economists will argue that, and I think rightly, that perfection in safety is not ideal. 
You don't want absolute safety because it would be extremely expensive to get that absolute safety. You would have to give up too much else to get it. If you look at the federal arsenic standard, marginal cost per life saved increased dramatically as you increase the safety standard, as you as effectively reduce the quantity of arsenic allowable. You cut the standard in half, you're going to increase the marginal cost per life saved by about 10 times. You cut it to one-tenth of the current standard, you're going to increase the marginal cost per life by another six or seven times. So, uh, the, the marginal costs have to be taken into consideration, and yet regulators are very bad at this. For example, one study, this is an older study, but it shows that a, a regulation by the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, could add an extra year of life for, for $23,000. An Occupational Safety and Health Administration regulation could add a year of life for $88,000. An EPA regulation will cost you approximately, according to the study, about $7.6 million per year of life saved. Um, so I'm, I'm not arguing for FAA or OSHA regulation, but I am saying that the, the marginal costs of regulation can quickly get to very high levels if the, if the government's not paying any attention to the trade-offs that are appropriate. And in fact, as uh, Mises would point out, as early as 1920, there's no way for governments to know the appropriate trade-offs. This is the socialist calculation problem. With the absence of prices, with the absence of voluntary interaction between buyer and seller, we don't know what the right uh, level of safety might be. According to the Office of Management and Budget, and this, again, is older data, but it's still illustrative, I think. An auto fuel system integrity standard costs about $400,000 per premature death averted, if you want to use that as a standard. A trenching and excavating standard, which uh, requires uh, people who dig trenches to put certain um, safety equipment in place to prevent the trench from caving in, uh, 15, uh, sorry, $1.5 million per premature life averted. The asbestos ban, about $111 million per premature life or death averted. A hazardous waste disposal ban, about $4.2 billion per premature death averted. And I'm, I will readily admit my life is not worth $4.2 billion. Um, Atrazine, there's a standard for atrazine in water. The maximum allowable amount of atrazine in drinking water is three parts per billion. This is, I, you would say that that number's astronomical, but I think now we have to say this is on the level of federal finance. Astronomical is now smaller numbers than federal de deficits. But to give you an idea of what three parts per billion would be, imagine one of these uh, 16,000 gallon railroad tank cars that you see, the big round things uh, on the railroad, and stand on top of those, one of those cars with an aspirin, break it in half, crumble it up, and drop it in that water, and that's three parts per billion of aspirin. All right. Now, Imagine the cost of reducing atrazine in water when you're having to achieve that level of, of purity. The cost per premature death averted for atrazine, the atrazine standard, is $92 billion. This is a lot of money. To the extent that we're taking money from some other purpose and devoting it to reducing the level of atrazine in water or reducing formaldehyde or asbestos or some other toxin, we are reducing human well-being. 
if those funds could have been used for some other purpose that would make people better off. Regulators have little incentive to consider these things, and in fact, they don't have enough information to make these decisions in the first place. Um, there are private sector alternatives. There's private certification. You will find, uh, if you go to the grocery store, you'll see things on uh, uh, food items that say gluten-free or peanut-free, or they'll, they'll tell you if it was you know, manufactured in a manufacturing process that included some allergen, peanuts or something. Not all of these are required by regulation. Some of these bits of information, and especially if you consider the information that is incorporated into a brand or incorporated into some sort of uh, proprietary symbol on the product that tells you this is certified by some organization to be free of this uh, particular ingredient, that information that's privately provided is serving a useful purpose in the marketplace. So we have recourse other than federal agencies trying to tell us uh, how much information should be provided and what ingredients can be included and so forth. There's underwriters' laboratories. Mark Thornton has an article. It's, uh, it's some years old now, but uh, you can take a look on Mises.org. And I think the name of the article is What Keeps Us Safe. Take a look at that. Underwriters' Laboratories is a private organization. It, you produce a product, you take it to Underwriters' Laboratories, and they'll investigate it for you, do some various lab tests to it, and find out whether it's going to be safe or not, and put their little stamp of approval on it. You look at the back of an, uh, of an electronic device, and it's likely to have a variety of these stamps and certifications and so forth to tell you whether it's going to um, uh, you know, set your house on fire or something. Um, I was writing a, um, some years ago and, and had occasion to look at this certification issue, and it turns out that in the, in the old Soviet Union, there was some small number of people who were killed by their television sets exploding. We don't even think about that in the United States, um, about you know, what's the risk that my TV is going to... Now, of course, flat screens, different technology. I can't imagine one of those things exploding, but the old you know, cathode ray tube giant things that were this thick and... Uh, those things, uh, in, if you lived in the Soviet Union, you're sitting there watching TV and it might blow up on you. Now this is a, of course, a very heavily regulated production process in the Soviet Union. The government's supposed to ensure the safety of consumers and, of course, they, they cannot and they don't. Good housekeeping seals of approval. Brand names that I've mentioned before, brand names are an, a, a more important form of certification of safety than I think people recognize. What happened when, years and years ago, uh, Jack in the Box um, was sued because of, uh, I think, four children dying of food poisoning after consuming some of their hamburgers? Had E. coli, I think, in them. What happened after that? Jack in the Box was disciplined by the market, and when you have a a standalone restaurant with no significant brand name, a mom and pop type restaurant, people, especially people who are, who are from out of town, may not know too much about the quality of that restaurant. But if you have a brand name for a franchise that may cover thousands of restaurants over a wide geographical area, what that's telling you is you can retaliate, you and everybody else can retaliate against the entire corporate enterprise if they do you wrong. So if you visit some particular town and you go into a Taco Bell or a McDonald's or a Burger King or something and, and you get food poisoning because of your experience there, it doesn't matter if you don't go back to that one particular restaurant anymore. As soon as the word gets out that this particular restaurant was associated with this food poisoning case, the entire chain will suffer. This is a form of market discipline. It's giving the customer the chance to, uh, to essentially retaliate against someone who 
produced a product that was less safe than they had anticipated. You might have read about the well-known lulling effect. This is um, a misperception on the part of consumers of the efficacy of some safety device, which leads people to then reduce their own personal safety precautions. One of the best examples of this was the uh, uh, requirement that uh, medical, uh, medicine bottles have a child safety cap on them. Well, um, if you look at the poisoning rates from uh, analgesic products like Tylenol or, or other, other such products, um, the poisoning rate went up after the regulation appeared requiring child safety caps. It went from 1.1 per thousand in 1971 to 1.5 per thousand in 1980. If you take into account the increase in the sales of Tylenol over that period of time and the increase in the sales of related products, that only accounts for about half of that increase, from 1.1 to 1.5. So the overall implication of the analysis was that there was about 3,500 additional poisonings every year of children under five resulting from the adoption of safety caps. Now, you don't, this, this is to indicate you don't do away with the asymmetric information problem just because you required some safety feature. You still don't know how safe this device is. And as a result, you may, you're like, likely to assume that the safety is greater than, it, than in fact is afforded by this uh, device. Empirical evidence also suggests that the, the safety mechanism required on these uh, butane cigarette lighters also produce, produces similar results, that, that parents don't take as much care about where they keep these lighters. Um, same thing was happening apparently with the Tylenol uh, bottles. The, um, uh, you know, if I have no, no safety cap on the bottle of medicine, I'll keep it in a medicine cabinet out of reach, maybe a locked medicine cabinet. Um, I'll take more care to watch where my children are and make sure that they don't get into the medicine. But if I think, well, there's a safety cap on it, they can't get into it anyway, I'm just going to put it wherever I want, and it might be down below the sink or something where they can get into it. I may not put it on the little child safety latch uh, on the cabinets, there's other things that I may not do in the assumption that the child safety cap is sufficient to, to accomplish the uh, safety, degree of safety that I want. So uh, uh, we can, again, we can, we can inadvertently back into a safety problem as a result of the regulation. Gun safe storage laws. Um, there's a um, review from uh, 2004 in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics of uh, John Lott's book called The Bias Against Guns, Why Almost Everything You've Heard About Gun Control is Wrong, uh, a review by Dale Steinrich. And uh, uh, apparently, um, according to a General Accounting Office um, study, uh, Gun locks, which were required some years ago, um, were only reliable in thwarting children under the age of seven. Uh, George Bush, W. Bush, supported a program in Texas while he was governor there that made these uh, made some requirement that these be provided at no additional cost to gun owners. But Lot was arguing in his book that they were dangerous because they can limit your quick access to guns when they're needed for self-defense, especially locks that prevent the gun from being stored loaded. There's trigger locks and there's other kind of locks, and I'm not familiar with all of them, but basically uh, Lott's reasoning um, uh, is that, that not only did the locks restrict access to the firearm, but they carried a stigma with them that you're communicating to the buyer of the gun that this is an incredibly dangerous thing. 
And of course, they, they can be dangerous, and uh, yet it may have increased the perception of the danger higher than it would have been otherwise, so that uh, there may have been a reduction in firearms ownership, and then that reduction in ownership makes people more vulnerable to predation. So, uh, empirically, a lot found that, you know, it, it, and a lot of the regulation is based on empirics, so um, I, I would argue that the regulation is invalid on other grounds, but it, you know, if you're going to base the regulation on empirics, I have no trouble fighting fire with fire on this. Um, if, uh, if you look at the empirics on this, Lott finds that the safe storage laws had no effect on accidental gun deaths or aggregate suicide rates. There was a slight, slight evidence of a reduction in juvenile suicides, but the only consistent effect of the laws, according to Lott, was to increase rapes, robberies, and burglaries. Uh, the 15 states that enacted these uh, safe storage laws had an increase of um, a total of about 3,700 rapes, 21,000 robberies, and about almost 50,000 burglaries. Um, during the five years after passage of those laws, those 15 states saw a yearly average rise of 309 murders and over 25,000 aggravated assaults. And that makes those safe storage laws pretty dangerous. So when you're looking at regulation and consumer product safety regulation, I'd, I'd like for you to think about several things, just to kind of sum up here. Think about the inadvertent effects of that regulation. Think about what's going to happen as you incur costs, because that money could have been used elsewhere. Think about what other things you're doing that could create uh, risk as a result of the regulation. I ask students sometimes on, on, on their tests in my regulation class, I say, well, let's suppose we had some sort of uh, fireplace safety act, which requires people to get an inspection of their chimneys for soot buildup and to prevent chimney fires, and we require people to do this every year. Right. So would this be a good idea? I mean, considering that there are a certain number of chimney fires every year and People are um, uh, sometimes killed in fires resulting from chimney, uh, chimney fires. Would, th would this help? Well, it's, you may in fact reduce deaths resulting from chimney fires, but the regulation is going to have another effect, which would be you're going to now have a whole lot of chimney sweeps climbing up on ladders trying to get on your roof to sweep out your chimney. People climbing on ladders occasionally fall. When they fall, they usually injure themselves or even die. So you could be trading off a small reduction in the number of chimney fire deaths for a larger number of deaths of chimney sweeps. In, in saying all of this, I don't want you to lose, one of the, lose sight of one of the most important arguments against, against regulation, which is that when two people want to trade, um, I think you can make a strong ethical case for saying that they ought to be left alone to trade under whatever conditions they prefer, which means that regulation per se would be um, out of bounds for uh, a consistent libertarian. And um, I, I've not concentrated on that argument here today. I've been looking mostly at the, the actual effects of regulation, which I've argued have been bad. But there's an ethical argument, too, which I think is important and perhaps definitive on this issue. With that said, um, I'm almost out of time. I've got about five minutes for questions. If you have any, um, I can take one or two, and, and then we'll be done. Yes. Um, I would recommend that you look, in, it's in the first uh, two or three chapters of uh, Tom Wood's book, Meltdown. He deals with that little issue of the 
rating agencies, and he says, look, rating agencies were basically being pressured, strongly pressured, by the, um, uh, by the government to rate uh, mortgage loans favorably. These securitized loans, they would rate them AAA when they really shouldn't have been. Um, we understand that now in retrospect, but what people lose sight of is the fact that they were under intense pressure to go along with the political tide and uh, favor um, this kind of broad home, home ownership agenda that, that the government had been pushing for at least 15 or 20 years, and probably much longer than that. So I don't think you can take the rating agencies and say, well, these, this is an example of the private sector failing, because it wasn't truly private. There was already that intervention there that was, that was influencing those decisions. In the back, yes. Right, uh, wrong, I think it's, um, I see your point. It's, and, and yet people do assign some weight to a government's decisions on things, and they don't pay very close attention. They, gathering information is costly. This is why we economists say that voters are rationally ignorant. And when it comes to regulation, people are rationally ignorant. All they may see is a headline, FDA or, or EPA uh, makes a regulation to reduce mercury in fish. And they may not think, well, this only applies really to this group, and the cost to me would be less than the benefits of eating more seafood. Another example of this kind of thing would be um, uh, regulations to try to uh, um, reduce um, uh, chemicals to, to uh, kill fungus and disease and insects and so forth on, on vegetables, fruits and vegetables. And, and, and people look at this and say, well, I, I, don't, I don't want to eat fruits and vegetables that have pesticides and so forth on them, but if they back away from that, they're going to incur the other disadvantages that come from not eating, eating enough fruits and vegetables. I, I, I do think that people tend to make better decisions for themselves than a regulator would make for them, but the regulators, that, that little bit of information that, the, that people assign to the regulation itself can skew the market by causing people to think differently about the risk, the relative risk, than, than otherwise. There's a, there's a chapter in Harold Winter's little book called Trade-Offs, which I sometimes use, where he says that people may actually not smoke enough cigarettes. Because all of this propaganda that you get about how terrible cigarettes are, now we've got the new little regulation about the you know, the pictures, like they've had in Europe for some time, you know, fold, in, in England, you fold out the little thing on the pack of cigarettes and got somebody's lung on there. And you, you look at this and, you, oh, this is horrible. I, cigarettes should be banned completely. And, and yet, there is a cost-benefit assessment that goes along with smoking. Apparently, smoking do, I don't smoke, but apparently, smoking does create some benefits. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it. But if governments increase the the apparent cost, and, do, and we, so we perceive those more readily than we perceive the benefits, then we may not actually engage in the activity enough. Kind of like if people think that flying in an aircraft is more dangerous than it really is, they'll end up in their cars, and they'll end up dying in their cars on the highways because highway deaths per mile are much higher than air travel deaths per mile. That's a long answer to a short question. But. I think I'm out of time. I can take any other questions over here after we're done. <laughs>